Morning, everybody. As you hear, I, I, I'm a cardiologist, and uh, as a cardiologist, I fear to tread into neurological territory. And I'm not going to talk about microbleeds or cerebral amyloid angiopathy or previous intracranial hemorrhage, but no doubt it'll all come up in the discussion. But I am going to talk about contraindications in a loose way, because we're really interested in patients who cannot legitimately take anticoagulants. And these are patients who have adverse events, patients in whom the anticoagulant won't work, and patients or their doctors who won't use anticoagulants. And those are the big three categories of patients where we have major problems at the present. This is a famous cover of the BMJ, Rivers of Blood. And it was used to introduce a lot of investigative journalism about bleeding on anticoagulants, NOAC anticoagulants, and specifically dibigatran. A similar witch hunt is going on now, led by bad drugs, etc., in the USA with rivaroxaban. And so we're seeing a lot of interest in this particular adverse event. I have to show you that I do have lots of conflicts. I'm not yet being labelled as corrupt, but it's surely coming because I have lots of connections with drug companies, both for grants and some personal fees. But there are also other academic uh, potential competing interests. So let me start by putting you in the picture about the current state of play in some American hospitals, which are the very best that North America has to offer. So this appeared recently in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. These places, Humana, Aetna, Harvard, Pilgrim, these are the insurance companies sponsoring these hospitals. 16.2 million patients they look after, 230,000 had AF, 200,000 of those had CHADS-VAS scores of two or more. And if we look at how many were anticoagulated, it's 52%, just 105,000 of those who should have been anticoagulated. And if you look at those who were anticoagulated, the proportion of days covered by their prescriptions was 32% of days on average. So it's a pretty dire situation. And you can see from this slide that women are less anticoagulated than men. So with that in mind, let's turn now to the issue of why patients don't get anticoagulants. They're ineligible for some reason, such as histories of bleeding events, such as co-prescription of medications that will encourage adverse events, such as severe renal insufficiency, often a contraindication to NOACs and increasingly recognized as a major contraindication for warfarin because warfarin accelerates renal impairment. Most physicians do not understand that, but it's now a well-documented e uh, event. Recurrent falls puts off many doctors from prescribing anticoagulants. Uh, the difficulty in achieving good time in therapeutic range with uh, warfarin, non-compliance from patients, and to some extent, doctors from the use of anticoagulants and embolic strokes and other ischemic events in patients who are taking anticoagulants. So let's start simply by looking at the, to some extent, the influence of scoring schemes and to some extent, the consequences of uh, the, the fact that the patients score badly on these scores. So we can see that in this frail AF study reported from Canada, the higher the CHADS-VAS score, the more likely a patient will be anticoagulated. But look at the dramatic decline associated with the HASBLED score. Now, I'm not sure it's a consequence, but lots of people worry about this, and that's why the HASBLED score was scrapped. It doesn't exist anymore for us to make decisions on the basis of it. We can, of course, use it to get a fair idea of what the likely consequences of anticoagulation might be. But look also at this clinical frailty score. 
which is increasingly used, and you can see above seven, the use of anticoagulants really drops off very dramatically. So elderly patients who are frail are rarely anticoagulated, although they have no specific contraindications, just an element of frailty, often a gut feel feeling by the doctor. Now, f I mentioned the falls issue. There's this very famous modeling paper. It's not really based on any proper data by uh, Manson Hing. And they worked out that a patient had to fall approximately 300 times to risk any serious adverse intracerebral hemorrhage. And therefore, they said, don't use falls as an excuse for not anticoagulating patients. And many guidelines have picked that up and written that in the guideline. But of course, not all falls are the same. And most doctors appreciate if patients fall and crack their head open, break their bones, and so on and so forth, that's a very different fall to just swooning gently to the floor. And therefore, some clinical uh, expertise has to be used. Now, this is a, a very interesting issue. Co-medications. If you prescribe anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs together, the bleeding risk increases dramatically. So, for example, if we take somebody who's on triple therapy, that's two antiplatelet drugs and an anticoagulant, you can see that the bleeding risk is approximately double that of using single antiplatelet therapy or single anticoagulant. But you can see that the reason for triple therapy is usually to prevent cardiovascular events. So you can see here the cardiovascular event rate, and you can see it halves when you move from a single antiplatelet drug to triple therapy. So there's a really difficult decision to be made whether or not you can use dual antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation together. Now, fortunately, we've had a number of registry data and a number of small trials that have demonstrated that a single antiplatelet, usually clopidogrel of one of the thenopyridines, together with warfarin, is much safer and probably equally as effective as triple therapy. So, for example, we've just had reported at uh, the American Heart Association a, a month or so ago that if you use warfarin plus dual antiplatelet therapy in a population of patients who have just had an acute coronary syndrome or are getting an elective stent, that you can reduce in absolute terms by about 9 or 10 percent the likelihood of uh, major bleeding by simply using a combination of a NOAC plus a single antiplatelet drug, i.e. clopidogrel mostly, or using a low dose of the anticoagulant together with dual antiplatelet therapy. So there are many strategies emerging to try and deal with this so that it is no longer a significant contraindication. Now, we've heard that gastrointestinal bleeding is an issue, and in the rough meta-analysis of which we've seen ver several variations, and people didn't comment on this, but this is really the adverse feature of the so-called NOAC drug, that gastrointestinal bleeding is 25% increased. We know about the 50% reduction in hemorrhagic stroke. We know about the significant 10% reduction in mortality. And remember, that's on top of the 26% reduction with warfarin. So this works out at about 33% altogether, reduction in mortality. And GI bleeding, on the other hand, is more frequent in the NOAC drugs. Now, fortunately, and I think this is really important for us to understand, the vast majority of GI bleeding, and here you see adoxaban, one of the NOACs, compared with warfarin, the vast majority of these bleeds are not fatal. And the problem is that when a patient has a GI bleed, doctors stop the anticoagulant. Of course they do, because you have to manage the acute situation. But what happens is they forget to restart the anticoagulant. And so if you track the patient's down line, the incidence of mortality from stroke is much higher 
if you don't restart the anticoagulant. So this GI bleed issue is one that we shouldn't think of as a contraindication. We should think of it as something that has to be attended to, but certainly not a contraindication, unless it's due to something like a, a congenital vascular lesion in the, in the gut that can't be mended. Most gut problems can be mended, can be attended to, and we should start the anticoagulant. Now, one of the reasons why doctors don't like anticoagulants is they fear the bleeding consequences. And many doctors would rather not use an anticoagulant because they don't want to cause a bleed and they don't mind not attending to the problems which are natural, in other words, the stroke that the patient gets to. So this study by LaHaye tried to ask patients what they thought of that. Would you put up with a bleed if you were going to not have a stroke. Now, interestingly, they found that 12% of patients were completely medication-averse. They would not consider taking an anticoagulant no matter what the balance, no matter what the advantages were. And of the patients who were willing, however, to consider anticoagulation, 42% were said to be risk-averse and 15% risk-tolerant. But the important feature was that the average patient would endure four major bleeds to prevent one stroke. Now, I don't know whether the picture was accurately portrayed to these patients, but they did their best to try and get an estimate of this. Because if you do the same experiment with doctors, you don't get this view. The doctors are terrified of GI bleeding. And one of the things they're doing, and this was alluded to earlier in this session, is that they're prescribing low doses of these NOAC drugs, for example. And the same was true with warfarin. They were running patients very low in the therapeutic range. But look at this, a Pixaban, 25 milligrams twice daily, average 37% of patients in this data set. In the clinical trial, it was less than 5%. With the bigger tran, it's 50% getting the lower dose. In fact, it's getting higher now at about 60 to 65%. When you made the estimate from the SMPC, from the drug label, it should be 29%. In, in the trial, of course, it was simply a randomization, so it was 50-50. But if you, if you try to work out who should have got it according to the label, it should be 30%, but 50 to 60% are getting low dose, and with Rivaroxaban, more than in the trial. So it's a real concern, because surely, if you reduce the dose you are going to have a reduction in the efficacy of the drug in preventing the ischemic stroke, the whole reason for giving the drug. But you will reduce bleeding. So let's look at this uh, data, these data from the Danish registry uh, that were just presented at the American Heart. Using the low dose of apixaban, there's a very much higher stroke rate than the low dose of the other drugs. We know with the bigger trend, the low dose is equivalent to warfarin in terms of ischemic strokes. But if we look at bleeding, for example, we can see that bleeding is lowest with the Bigotran in the low dose compared with these other drugs. So this is the hazard. If you use the low dose, you're going to get more strokes. Now, we've seen this uh, image several times. It's about the so-called modifiable risk factors. And that's what we should be using the HasBled score for. We should be looking specifically at these four issues. Uncontrolled hypertension, not a history of hypertension, not the fact that the patient's taking antihypertensive drug, but what is the blood pressure? If it's high, we should bring it down. Label INR for those patients taking warfarin co-medications, as I've discussed, and excess alcohol. Now, there's no study which has been conducted that shows you that any of these do have an advantage. It's all theoretical. So we set about modeling it in the data from the real world. So we took the results of the Xanta study with rivaroxaban. And there, of course, there are only three modifiable risk factors because we don't have the INR component. And we modeled what would happen if you added the general risk from the other risk factors and then had three, two, 
one or no modifiable risk factors. And you can see you go from 16 to 8 percent, from 8 to 4, from 4 to 2. In other words, you can dramatically reduce bleeding according to this model based upon the results of the Xantos study. Now, we're also supposed with warfarin patients to think very carefully about how we select patients who will stick, who will be able to stay within the normal therapeutic range. And this scoring scheme was introduced. It's discussed in the ESC guidelines. It wasn't adopted by the ESC guidelines. And I don't think as a score it really stands up, even though these C statistics are very uh, comforting. But I think these are the sort of factors, interestingly, that can tell you whether a patient is likely to stay within the therapeutic range, for example. If the score is high, a two or more, then they need help, more education, etc., more devices to help them take the medication. And these factors are uh, female gender, age less than 60, in other words, young patients, medical history of comorbidities, the, whether they're on rhythm control or rate control, use of tobacco, and uh, the race with uh, non-whites scoring two points. Now, one of the problems we have is that patients don't take the drugs on time. They miss out doses, even if they persist with the therapy. They're missing out on sticking to the prescription. We don't have much data on whether this makes uh, an influence on outcome, but we do have some. First of all, this is a study from a national cohort looking at dabigatran. It comes from North America. If you use the measure of the number of days covered by the prescription, you can find that 30% of the patients do not have adequate cover. 30% taking. They just don't pick it up from the pharmacist, so they can't take it. We don't know whether this 70% who do pick it up actually swallow it. We don't know whether it hits gastric acid, but at least they've got the pill. But if we take this group that didn't have enough pills, we can see they had more hazard, a 13% increase in the combined output of all-cause mortality and stroke. So it probably and logically it would make a difference. And also we have this huge problem with patients just stopping anticoagulants. It really is amazing. These were data presented at the European Society of Cardiology, uh, only showing warfarin and apixaban. Apixaban was the best, warfarin was the worst. Look at this. At one year, 60% of patients had stopped taking warfarin. And at one year, 30% of patients, or even higher, had stopped taking apixaban, one of the easiest drugs amongst anticoagulants to take. So this is a really significant issue and we have to try and work out the best ways of dealing with it. And a trial has been conducted called Aegean which randomized patients to much better education compared with standard of care and it showed that for the first few months the better education really worked. After that it didn't have any effect but in this trial it the compliance with therapy was very good and that was because they had this device which is a device which registers every time the patient takes the pill out of the packet. Again, it doesn't, hit, doesn't tell us about gastric acid but it, it does tell us if they take the pill out of the package and the compliance was 95% in this particular trial. So let me just uh, finish by saying that these so-called Contra, uh, contraindications, absolute or relative, or ineligibilities or unsuitabilities are all really important because they are potential indications for alternative forms of therapy, such as, for example, the left atrial appendage occlusion device. I'm not going to just run through them. I think all of us know these specific categories. But remember, if anticoagulants don't work, if patients don't take them, if doctors don't prescribe them, or if the anticoagulants cause serious adverse effects, or if there is an underlying pathophysiology that suggests that an adverse event is almost inevitable, then we should be thinking more broadly than simply thinking of writing a prescription for a pill. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.